it's Sharon Kelly here from the Berwick Public Library and tonight I have the great pleasure of bringing back a local author who has completed his third book in a series and he is going to talk to us about that tonight. His name is Robert Spencer and his book is called Francina Hallett's Heart and again it's part of his trilogy that he's here to talk to us about. So please welcome Robert Spencer to Berwick Public Library. Thank you very much, Sharon. I appreciate that. Uh, it's nice to have a second visit to the library. We have a lovely facility here. Um, nice open stacks. Uh, it's nice to be in a library. I'm, I'm from Waterford, all right? Uh, Waterford, Maine. Our library is probably 25% of this. Um, um, and things are really tight, so it's nice to have an open space like this. Um, the last time I was here, which was October 21, um, I was introducing the second novel in, in my series, which we call the Francina, uh, excuse me, the uh, Lizzie Millet series. Um, the first book, which came out in 18, was called The Spinster's Hope Chest. And it, it covers a period of time, historically speaking, a historical setting of 1860 to 1888. Um, the second one, which I was here a, a year and a half ago, was talking about prospects, mining Maine for riches. This is a story which covers a period of time in Maine history where local mines were opening up, uh, uh, mineral mines, uh, uh, mica mines, for example. Uh, some gem mines were opening up in primarily Oxford County, which is where this book takes place for the most part. Um, it's very historically accurate. The one that we're talking about today is Francina Hallett's Heart. Uh, its subtitle is A Novel of Romances and Revenge. And when I first started writing uh, novels, that's I retired. I retired in uh, 13. Uh, I was a landscape architect and <clears throat> ran several businesses down in the Boston area. And at the time I retired, my wife and I moved up to uh, South Waterford, Maine. We had a mill building that we, we had purchased um, in, this, in the 1976 and we had worked on it periodically over the years. Uh, kept it pretty much as it was. It's an industrial building. It sits on the top of a, of a 30 foot long, 30 foot wide, 8 foot high split rock dam. And when we moved up there, I, as my usual uh, habit is, I wanted to find out about the history of the area in which we lived. So I started doing research for the historical society. And I think all three novels stay very accurate to the history of the period, the history of Southern Maine. Um, this one, the latest one, ends in, in uh, 1910. It goes from approximately first, the first decade of the 20th century. So these are historical novels, but they're more than that. They're more than historical novels. If historical novels don't have development and, and other interests, then they're not going to be of interest to too many readers, I think. So these novels actually, I think, are about relationships within a historic setting. Um, the first one, the story of two, two women, the, the Millet sisters, who were born in my town, South Waterford, in the 1860s during the Civil War. Very difficult time to be born in southern Maine or anywhere in Maine at that time, Civil War. In our town, uh, there were 18 men who were either killed or injured bad enough so they couldn't live normal lives in town. So the, the town was really devastated. It was a very, very bad time. But it's the story of how the two, these two women get their lives together and during, during the, the time when, mi when mills were opening up, they actually were working in mills in order to, to, to make a living to help the family at home. Um, the second one 
um, this fact to prospects again. The second one is very, very well documented, meaning it took me about almost a year of research. The Historical Society in Waterford asked me to find out if there was, what was the history of mining in Waterford, just in Waterford. Um, we're, we have Bethel, we have Lovell, we have um, all these areas around us that were very well known, Green, Greenwood as an ex example, uh, Albany, places that were very well known as having mines. W what happened in Waterford? So it took about a year of research to come up with the fact that there were actually 11 prospects in Waterford. Two or three of them were mines. Two or three had some commercial value. But most of them were just basically holes in the ground, holes in the farmer's field, uh, where they, one man uh, 18, in the 1840s, a farmer in Sweden, on the Sweden-Waterford line, was out plowing his fields. And he found a piece of amethyst that was about six, six inches long, terminated at both ends. He thought it was Native American art. And when someone informed him that it was a valuable piece of naturally occurring gem, he spent the next year trying to find more in his fields, but that was the only piece that was ever found there. So the, there's a prospect. He, he thought he had a prospect. But it's more than that. It's a story of a man who comes down from Canada. His name is Clarence Leslie Potter. He's an actual historical figure. He comes down from Canada where he's in copper miner, doing very poorly. He comes down here, he leaves his family. He comes down here and he wants to get rich quick. He's heard about tourmalines, the gems were being found in, in Maine. And he wants to get, find buckets of them, just like the stories that he's heard. It's how he relates to the people, though, and how the people in the, in the story relate to him. Uh, the two women who were born, who were born in, in, in the first book, they're both in this book also. And it's how, did, how does he, how does Clarence and his life affect them? Uh, the, what's the relationships that they have? The third one, which came out just this year, came out, uh, well, it came out um, October um, 22. This one is really about relationships. That's as well as you can tell, a novel of romances and revenge. Um, the main character in this, Francina Hallett, she's an infant in this book. She's the daughter of one of the Millet sisters. She's a niece of the other sister. And the niece, the, the aunt, her aunt, is in, in, in this book is opening up her own business in Westbrook. She's a, a, a seamstress, a dressmaker. She trained, she learned her trade working in Biddeford, in, um, in, in one of the mills down in Biddeford. And she's, in this book, she has trained her niece, uh, Francina, to take over her business. She has a business as an actual shop. But, uh, I didn't know it when I wrote the book, but we found that, that there actually was a, a Lizzie Millet who lived in Westbrook about this time. And she had a shop attached to her house. Um, so Francina has learned enough to take over the business. However, she wants something more out of life than just being a business person, being a, a seamstress, being a dressmaker. What she wants is uh, to have a family. She has a dear friend uh, named Lottie. Lottie was, a, Lottie was married to Clarence. And <clears throat> Lottie has uh, two lovely little boys. Two lovely little boys. Francina wants her own little boys. So it basically follows her through a series of, of, of ways that she's trying to do both things. She's trying to balance her life and be able to live a life. Someone told me, well, geez, that's kind of a modern problem. That's a modern thing, 20th, 21st century, 20th century. I don't think so, if you think about it. If you look back at your own, your own the women in your family, your grandmothers and aunts and all, I think they all had the same 
they were trying to do something with their lives, but in many cases there wasn't any opportunities. Um, you could be a teacher, or you could be a nurse, uh, a homemaker, or you might work with, you know, in a mill, but they're, they're trying to just balance the life out, and so it was enjoyable. So, what I thought I would do would be to, I'm going to have to stand up a minute. What I thought I would do would be to show you how some of these relationships work, again, in a historic setting. Um, the, in the first book, uh, Spinster's Hope Chest, this is a slice of history. This is probably the most historical uh, book of the three. Um, it's based on a letter uh, that was written by a woman who knew Lizzie Millet when she was a girl. And uh, the, I found the letter, and the letter had a story about Lizzie's life. And I adapted that story. So it's, it's historically very close to, to reality as far as the setting. But there's more in it than, as I said, there's more than history. So Lizzie has several relationships um, that, are, that are part of this, um, these stories. And just an example, um, page 49, okay. She's, um, in this book, in this, at this setting, she's living with her, part of the way that Lizzie and, and Hattie Millett got out of their dif difficult life together at, at the start was they ended up living with their grandparents in, um, in Westbrook. Um, the grandpa grandfather ran a, a, um, a granite quarry in, um, in, on Route 302 Forest Avenue in, um, in Westbrook. If you know where the uh, drive-in theater is, the, um, the Pride's Corner drive-in theater, right near there there's a, a, a Swenson's uh, granite stone yard. Across the street from that was a mill that the, that the grandfather, I mean, excuse me, a, 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 a mine that the grandfather ran pre-Civil War, uh, became Pride's Quarry eventually. Uh, it's now a business, um, Audet, the specialty construction company, has filled in part of the quarry and built a, new, a brand new building there, but you can still see the water uh, where the pond is. Anyway, she's living, they're living with the grand, grandparents. And one of the workers there is uh, by the name of Henry. So one Saturday afternoon, Liz and Henry walked alone to the orchard to select apples for the Sunday dinner pie. Henry climbed up onto the lower scaffold branches and plucked fruit, tossing each apple down to Liz, who quickly filled a willow basket. The sun shone brightly at the start, but a dark towering thunderhead soon popped up. Rain began to fall amidst the rash of boomers and lightning. The two ran quickly toward an ice house just off the barn. Ducking inside the heavy oak door, they turned and watched apple branches wave in gusting winds. Overripe fruit fell like giant hailstones onto the unmown grass. Each felt the other's warmth and sharp contrast to the chill that still radiated from the remaining blocks of lake ice buried in layers of sawdust nearly eight months after being sawn and, sto and stored. Let me hold that basket for you, Liz. It must be a bit heavy. He reached for the handle. Henry, you're so considerate. It really isn't too heavy, but the handle is rough on my hands. As she transferred the basket to him, their hands brushed lightly together. Both pulled back, allowing the basket to tumble onto the cold ground. As they laughed and bent down to gather the apples from the, deep, from the damp sawdust, Henry gazed at her. They had never been so close to each other. Yes, she was not a beauty, but her body did appeal to him. He reached out to touch her arm as she returned several fruits to the basket. His touch was warm to her bare skin, while it would have been more proper to pull back. She moved closer until they were face to face. Henry, I hope you don't find me shameless in saying that I really enjoy being with you. No, I feel the same about you, Lizzie. You have been so kind to me these last two years. 
When we are together in the evenings after supper, your reading has helped to show me worlds and thoughts that I've never known before. I want to thank you for that. He drew her face up closer and kissed her forehead gently. I'll, I take that as a thank you kiss. She smiled up at him, then raised up on her tiptoes and kissed him firmly on the lips. It was something she had never done. A shiver of passion spread through her. She wanted more, yet her feelings confused her. That is my, you're welcome. They withdrew from each other for a moment. Then he held out her hand, held out to her, reached out to hold her hand. She took his arm and placed it around her waist. Later, as the sun burned through the storm clouds, they slid the heavy door away and walked back toward the house, both keenly aware that their relationship had changed. So that could be, that could be, re, re, could be a uh, scene in a, a modern movie uh, somewhat, except if you look at the setting, the setting is very archaic. It's, uh, it's a, a post-Civil War farm type of setting. And so the relationships are, I think, very valid, but they're, they're not in our contemporary settings. Um, okay, so that's, that's another one. Then Nathan, Hattie's the sister who um, is Francina's mother. So she marries another man who's working at the quarry. And... Um, they both are very young. He's 17 when they marry. Hattie's 14. She's quite a beautiful woman, um, a, very, a young girl, but she's quite beautiful. So they have a struggle. To, the family has a struggle to keep them from getting married. But they finally get their way and get married. But he takes her on honeymoon to Boston. And let's see, 46, where are we? They um, go to the Parker House, if anyone knows the Parker House. No. The Parker House was, it was supposedly the Parker House, um, um, Emerson uh, stayed there. Emerson was at some point lived with his aunt in South Waterford, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And he had a room that he stayed in when he came down to, went down to Boston, was at the Parker House, uh, across the street from the old, um, old State House, I mean the old uh, town, um, City Hall. So Nathan wants to take his wife, young wife, down to a lovely place for vacation, for honeymoon, and they go to the Parker House. Nathan, Nathan, what a marvelous place. Hattie began as he lifted her over the threshold into their room. She wore a dark tweed travel coat with a pale green taffeta dress with long sleeves and a lace collar. Lizzie had taken such pride in presenting this most modern European style outfit to her after the marriage service. I feel like a princess in a castle. Where are my ladies in waiting? She laughed at her own words as Nathan kissed her cheek and set her down on a window seat seat atop a brocade cushion. That is exactly how I want you to feel today and every day you are my queen. You deserve to have a better life ahead of you than you've had in the past. They had discussed all the troubles of her early life and her stories had cut him to the quick, so much so that he wanted to protect her from the hard times in the future. He was by no means a wealthy man, though his father had bequeathed the generous estate to him and his mother. With these resources, he vowed to make a happy life for his new wife. As a uniformed bellhop carried the luggage into the room, Hattie removed her travel bonnet, allowing her long brown hair to cascade down in curls. She was so attractive in the sunlight that came through the window that the man who stood waiting for his tip could not help but stare. Nathan pressed several coins into the bellhop's hand and said to him, You'll not see a girl so beautiful in all of Boston or any place else, I'd say. So, Park House is still there. I don't know, I just have to go there and ask for the, the room. The, the, probably they call it the, the, the Emerson Room or something. But, so, so those are, the, those are some of the things that 
by by I, I, I have a, bit, a strong sales background um, a sales a number of different businesses that I either ran or um, or worked for and <clears throat> in, in my in looking at these books uh, as a way of selling them because that's what I've tried to do is to I write them and I create them but I have to sell them in order to keep going. And the way to sell them was, is, I was looking at this historically. It's a historical, historical fiction. And it continues to be that, but I think I missing, was missing out on the fact that there were so many interrelationships. And that's what makes books go. That's what makes people want to read books, is how do the, how do the characters relate, what, person to person. How do they change each other as they go, go through life? Okay, so, <clears throat> so you've, you've been introduced to some of the characters. Okay, in Prospects, which we talked about a year and a half ago. In Prospects, um, the main character, Clarence Leslie Potter, I don't particularly like him. Um, I think I was honest about that last time. He's conflicted. He, he, he has good points. But he has bad points. He, he and oftentimes the the bad part of his personality uh, takes over, and he is not may, maybe he's not aware of it. I don't know. But he he um, he's always looking to get rich quick. He's always looking to make the most that he can out of a situation quickly, which is good in a sense. He's got a family to raise. He's got bills to pay. So I mean that's good, but. He, um, he's a hard man to, 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 uh, to, to pinpoint, but he does come down here and he ends, ends up in relationships with a lot of different people. Um, and the ones that he, the ones I'd like to highlight is, um, bedtime meeting. Okay, it's page 96. Lottie, who's a Bostonian, she's from uh, Winchester. Uh, Lottie has uh, come up and, with her family to visit uh, friends in Maine, in southern Maine, <clears throat> and she meets Clarence. And Clarence has his eye out for a new wife. His first wife died. He's, out, he's looking for a new wife. He's very honest about it with himself. Uh, that's what he needs that needs to do because he still has two children for, uh, so he needs to take care of those children he needs so so he's looking to for uh, for a lovely woman to to hitch up with all right so Henry turned quickly and was shocked to see his new friend in her sleepwear Francina and ha and uh, and um, Lottie are friends and they're visiting, uh, so they are sleeping together. And um, and and, and uh, she gets up to go see Clarence. Oh, please come and sit beside me. I'm penning a letter to home, but I have not been able to find the right words. Moving over to make room on the small sofa, he padded a place for her to sit. Couldn't you sleep? I didn't want to sleep. Francina and I chatted for only a moment before she fell asleep. I've wanted to speak with you in private since our last chat on the park bench. Um, they're, oh, <clears throat> they're up in um, Bethel at this point. Hopefully you will not think me too forward, but I like you. I, I feel very close to you. Uh, don't you feel there's something between us? Yes, I feel that we have much in common, he says. We've only need, known each other for a few days, but we are friends already. I'm sure you have many admirers of, in your life and may not pay attention to a backwards minor such as I. As he spoke, his hand gently brushed hers, and when she did not pull away, he took a firmer hold of it with both hands. Clarence, my admirers are few, and the life that you demean as backwards is very appealing to me. I love it here in what my mother calls the wilds of Maine. There's no place anywhere near Winchester where I might dig a hole and find crystal, take crystals out of it. There are no mountains and forests in Massachusetts as big as these in Maine. And there is no one like you who have the bravery and strength to make a life in the Canadian woods. 
The intensity of her words made her voice become louder, so he held his hands, his finger to, his, to her lips to quiet her. Oh, forgive me, he, he whispered, pulling his hand away abruptly. I did not mean to touch you so personally. She looked at him with a blank expression for an instant before pulling his hand back to her face where she placed a kiss on its palm. You've done nothing for which you need to ask my pardon. Tenderness becomes you. Lottie, so much time has passed since I've had a tender moment with a beautiful young woman like yourself. Perhaps I have forgotten how to respond to, to affection. It is not my intention to push myself on you. When he placed her head on his chest, he kissed. The, when she placed her head on his chest, she, he kissed the top of her head. Please, Lottie, go back to bed. I wish nothing to happen that might push us apart. Tomorrow we will be traveling together, and we may have more private moments along the way. Lottie tiptoed back to the bedroom and slid between the sheets with Francina, who was aware of her friend's absence and sat up straight. Dearie, where have you been? Were you, were you sitting with Clarence? Yes, he and I had a friendly chat over the fire. Did he kiss you? No, silly, nothing of the kind, just simple conversation about our travels in the morning. So you get a feeling that the Clar Clarence is, he's, you know, he's friendly, but he's a little pushy, I'd say. Um, <coughs> yeah, this, um, he, um, he, he, he's, he had some sensitivities about him. Um, his first wife, Emma, and this goes back into the earlier part of the book, but his first wife, Emma, uh, lived with him in a, in a shack at, in a, on a mining town called, um, um, uh, what was the name of the mining town? In, in, in a small town that was set up to copper for copper mining in, in northern Ontario. So, oh, Cobalt, Cobalt, Ontario, appropriately named. <clears throat> Given more time to herself, this is Emma. Given more time to herself because of her husband's help being at home, Emma's health improved during the late winter to the point where she was able to enjoy their life together once again. Then in late February, as the weather moderated, she began to plan her new, her new vegetable garden, thinking that as soon as the snow cleared, she might lay out the beds. One night after supper, she went to the pantry, climbed up on a wooden stool, and pulled a large earthenware jar from the top shelf. In it were all the seeds she had brought from Yarmouth. They were married originally in, in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. Clarence sat by the stove writing another letter to Nathan. In it, he explained that Emma and her parents back in Nova Scotia, Scotia were against them relocating to Maine anytime soon, but that he would visit again in the spring. A loud crash sent him running to the kitchen. The seed jar had fallen to the floor, and Emma was crawling around trying to gather up the scattered seeds. As he joined her on the floor, she cried out, We must gather every seed. Can't lose a one. These are my hope. Tears slid down her cheeks as he grabbed her by the shoulders and looked directly into her eyes. Em, it's all right. We'll get them all. Please don't worry. I know how foolish I may seem. These are only seeds to you, but to me they are like, like the family blood in my veins. You believe in a better future. Not, not like me who looks to the past for my dreams. These seeds came from the garden of my grandfather and my grandmother. If they are lost, my hope will be lost too. So an, another relationship with Clarence. Um, so I mean, he's, he's, he's a decent sort most of the time. Um, so by the time I started writing Francina Hallett's Heart, I was starting to realize that the, I think I was becoming, <clears throat> someone said to me, what's your favorite book? Which, which of the three do you like? And I, they're all, I like them for different reasons. I like this one because it's the first one. It's your first born, you know, it's like a lifetime. <clears throat> but I think for the reader, this is probably the most entertaining because 
the characters are like all relating to each other, they're all developing and growing. Um, so Francina Hallett, the, the, the artwork, I'll explain the artwork. Um, actually, if you right there, there's those um, small posters, if you take one of those. The artwork was done by a local uh, Waterford artist, um, Sharon Harrison. <coughs> Excuse me. And when she read the draft went to, to come up with the illustration, to her, the two things that, that, that got her were that half of the story takes place in Westbrook, which is suburban. It's a, it's a, a suburban Portland, um, it's a Portland suburb, uh, still is a Portland suburb. It's almost like Portland now. <laughs> um, and the other half takes place in North Waterford, a very rural at this time, uh, just being really being built, rebuilt after a major fire. And she said, so there's the two poles, the traveling back and forth. Now, a lot of the action takes place on the road between the two, um, Naples, Waterford, um, Westbrook, uh, Wyndham, these, all these towns that are along 302. And one of the scenes that she thought was typified the, or was the important scene for the book was there's a scene with three boys, three little boys running in a field, and an eagle comes down f from the mountaintop and looks as if it's going to attack them. And the father has to run out there and stop them, stop the boys from being attacked. So she, that's what she chose for a cover. Um, so the stories in this, the story in this one, although it's still historically accurate, I'll keep, keep saying that, Hopefully that's, hopefully that's true when people read it. Um, Francina has, is, is looking, as I said, for a way to balance her career, her business, with her personal life. And she has several suitors or several people who have an interest in her, or she has an interest in. Um, one of these is a gentleman by the name of Eugene who is a store owner. He owns a store in Westbrook at Pride's Corner. Um, I found um, someone, when I went to the Westbrook Historical Society to talk about one of the books, a uh, lady there gave me a copy, digital copy of a, of a little pamphlet book called uh, The Early History of Westbrook, Maine. And in it was the, the story of Eugene. It wasn't exactly as I portrayed it, but it was, it was, it was the story that never, nevertheless was an interesting story. So Eugene's an interesting character. So here we go. So Franny's looking, Franny Francine is looking for someone, and she asks her advice from her aunt Lizzie, who is, uh, owns the business. <clears throat> well, here's my problem, says Francina. You know that I would like to meet a man and start a family. I haven't kept that a secret, though I probably should have. My dear, your parents have told me about your wishes, but only in passing. You can trust that I wouldn't, I haven't told a soul, not even Mary. Mary is um, uh, Lizzie's good, close friend. Thank you for keeping things private, Auntie. I, I sometimes think that everyone wants me to find a good husband. Feels like there is pressure on me to wed. That's likely your own pressure, but please go on. I suppose that's true. I see Lottie in a happy marriage at last. She and Nate are made for each other. It makes me want to find the same fulfillment, but when I meet a man who might be right for me, I'm always finding fault with him. He's too young, too old, too self-centered, there's always something. That must be really frustrating for you. Take Eugene Bailey, for example. He's reliable, at 32, he's very mature. He certainly has the wherewithal to take care of my material needs, but he, he isn't really much fun to be with, and he's so set in his ways. You know, I married, you know, said Lizzie, I married a man 
who was nearly twice my age. Moses certainly was set in his ways, yet he was so endearing. He cared for me and gave me the space I needed to be myself. Wouldn't Mr. Bailey do that for you? See, you called him Mr. Bailey, not Eugene. Even you can see he's much older than his age. I do not believe he has it in him to do what Moses did for you. Yesterday, we toured his grand new house, his castle. It's a mansion built for a king and queen. And it's very clear to me that he wants me to be his queen. She would stay at home and cook in her big kitchen, play in her garden and raise the children. Her voice had become very, very agitated. Franny, please calm yourself. There's no need to get so upset with a man who's obviously trying to be friendly. You don't have to marry him. There are others. So who are the others? Francina is it that so this is France this is Francina in Westbrook. Right. <coughs> She's visiting her friend Lottie in um, North Waterford. And she meets someone else. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, there we are. Okay. <clears throat> She's going shopping uh, in, the, in the general store in North, North Waterford Village. Good day, ma'am, said the young, young, tall young man behind the dry goods counter. Tis a pleasant day to be out. And you'd be quite right to say that. Indeed you would, she said. The man looked her up and down before returning to his work of stacking blankets on a deep wooden shelf. Is Mr. Nason here today, she asked. It's the first of the month, and I want to settle accounts. Oh, I can handle that for you, miss. Uh, what's the name on the account? Uh, I'll, I'll check in the ledger for you. Well, it's in the name of Potter, Mrs. Clarence Potter. Oh, yes, I have it right here. Are you a friend of Mrs. Potter's? Please tell her I'm very sorry to hear of Mr. Potter's death. I shouldn't have given that away, say. That's, that's, Mr. P Clarence has... has passed on. Um, yes, I'm a friend staying with the family for a while. Lottie Potter asked me to settle on her behalf. I'm Francina Hallett. My family lives in Bridgeton Center. Perhaps you know my father, Nathan Hallett. Franny smiled at the clerk and held out her hand. He didn't seem to know how to respond to the offer of a friendly shake. He was not used to women acting like men. After a couple of seconds, however, he reached out and shook her hand as he blushed. No, afraid not, uh, Miss Francina Hallett. He whispered her name several times, Francina Hallett. My name is Ethan. Once the account was paid, she presented him a list of needed provisions. As he moved about the store gathering her goods, she noticed how handsome he was and how tall. His full head of black hair was longer than most men's, but not messy by any means. He wore a short-sleeved shirt, and when he reached for a bag of flour from a high shelf, she noticed the well-formed muscles in his bare arms. Would you be needing a firkin of butter? We just had a delivery from South Waterford Creamery this morning. Real fresh. Their butter was given awards at the Freiburg Fair. Yes, I know about their butter. Please add that to the list. You're quite a salesman, aren't you? Again, Nathan blushed as he turned away to get a firkin from the ice chest. Anything else I might do for you, miss? No, you've been very helpful. Thank you. Don't mention it. Thank you for your business. Here is the invoice. I'll put it on your, uh, I mean, on the Potter account. Allow me to take the goods to your carriage. Mounting to the seat, she reached down to him. This time there was no hesitation. She shook the hand offered vigorously. Miss Hallett, I'm very pleased to have been able to assist you today. Hope to see more of you here in the future. On the way out of town, she thought about his final words. A smile came across her face as she thought of the Virginian. What's the Virginian? Do we know the Virginian? The Virginian was the first, well, you, on TV, right? There was, the, there was the, the cowboy's story on TV in the 60s, 70s. But the uh, Virginian was the first, it's considered to be the first novel of the American West. It came out in, um, in um, 1896. 
and it was uh, the Virginian. It was about a cowboy. You never knew his name. He was the Virginian. He was from Virginia, and a school teacher, who um, she she was from Vermont, and she was transferred to a school in uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. And they met each other in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And Lizzie Millet gave her niece a copy of the Virginian. And um, Francina starts to take a liking to the romantic image of the cowboy. So I'm telling you too much. And one last one, one last one. This one's kind of, could be contemporary, I guess. Um, there's a lady by the name of uh, Mary Flaherty, who is from County Clare. She and her sister, Neve, Maeve, um, lived with Lizzie when they w were working in, the, in, in, in Biddeford. They lived in a rooming house, a boarding house. And in this book, Mary moves away. Her father, her mother dies and her father is quite ill back in Lisdun Varna, which is a town in, in County Clare. <coughs> and she goes away. So it's 10 years she's gone take, taking care of her father. Her father finally passes. And she returns in this book and becomes a major character, and a supporting character in the book. Um, she and Lizzie have always liked each other. They've always been very buddy-buddy, very friendly, um, very cooperative. They seem to have like minds. So <clears throat> they're together in the business, in the shop. When the two older women were left alone at the table, Mary leaned down so very close to Liz that she, was almost, that she almost was sitting in her lap, although the singers made enough noise to drown out singing machines, the sewing machines, um, <clears throat> made enough noise to drown out regular conversation. The two whispered, You know, my dear, Mary began, when I first went to Bailey's store, the man hardly gave me the time of the day after I failed to respond to his interests. So this is Eugene, Eugene's store, Eugene Bailey in Westbrook. The only way he would take, would take one of our shirts that we make here was if I finally gave him one to wear. Because of Francina's smile and, and sunny disposition, he has created an entire rack for our line of, of clothes. Yes, and he's the one who keeps asking for her directly. From his tone, I take it, he has some interest in a relationship with her more personal than commercial. I hope she's not having, being too friendly to the man. He really isn't my style. He's kind of supercilious, if you ask me. Liz punched, pinched her friend's arm. Supercilious, is it? Been studying Webster's, have we? No, stop joking. I'm only thinking that a man like him might not have the girl's best interests at heart. Not sure what you mean. She's unmarried, and from what I can tell, is interested in finding a good man. Perhaps I'm worrying too much, Liz. After all, I've never been with a man. I get suspicious that they're only out for their own well-being, and it usually has something to do with sex. Doesn't everything between a man and a woman have sex involved in some way? Birds and bees, you know. Mary looked deeply into Liz's eyes with a grin. Neither of them looked away until Mary finally said, Birds and bees, is it? You know, my dear, it might be the same between birds and birds. Or bees and bees, whispered Liz. They both laughed. So that's my um, interview question. <laughs> um, and... <clears throat> So the relationships are very strong, and I think they get they got in the in the third book they're probably more as very entertaining for people to read, because they're, they're people are bouncing off each other and trying to understand how the other people are living. Um, but um, that's my that's the Lizzie Millet series, and thank you for letting me do this. <laughs>